Joining me now from our Perth studio is one of my favourites and one of your Sky favourites, Gemma Tognini, who was the founder and principal of her own public relations firm and also used to anchor for Sky and is a regular contributor. Gemma, thanks for joining us. And before we get underway, may I compliment you on that poignant and incredibly brave column you wrote in The Australian last weekend about about palliative care versus so-called voluntary assisted dying. It really put the case that I believe in, in eloquent and, and dare I say, emotionally vulnerable terms. A great piece and I commend it to our, our audience. You. Thank you so much, Catherine. Sure. Thanks, first of all, for having me uh, on the show and thanks for saying that. It was, um, yeah, I said to someone, I cracked yeah. open my own chest, ripped in, took a bit of my own heart out and, and wrote that and I think without you know, going into that issue in detail on this show right yeah. now, the reality of it, is, of it is only a third of patients in Australia mm. who want to access palliative care can access palliative care, only one third. So before we start talking about assisting people to take their own lives, mm. let's make sure there is actually a level playing field where every patient in this country who wants to access palliative care can access it. I totally agree with you and I... I know until very recently that was Bob Carr's position. He's changed recently, but I know Paul Keating has been very vol you know, voluble in opposing the so-called voluntary assisted dying. So it's not purely a progressive issue. But look, back to the week that's just transpired. And last time we spoke, I think you described uh, Anthony Albanese as being something of an invisible man, a night watchman, as it were, was the term you used. Mm. I tell you what, the government have done their best to make him look like Donald Bradman this week, haven't they? If you were <laughs> if you were scripting scripting the re-election campaign, how would you retrieve it from here? Because they look to me as though they're getting pretty much beyond the turning point. Oh, I don't know. I think I saw someone make the observation um, during the week that this is sort of where the coalition typically are this far out from an election, and I, I would say. There's an element of truth to that. And I, and I would also frame this election through the lens of COVID. We haven't had a federal election in this kind of electoral cycle before. Um, the, you know, the carry on this week in federal parliament and the cries of chaos and everything, you know, Liberal Party members crossing the floor and all of that sort of stuff. I think it's really important to remember, Catherine, that the Liberal Party has a, a history of, of MPs crossing the floor. It's not new. It's not something that's never been done in the history of Conservative politics. And that's because, you know, Liberal Party MPs don't have to go seek permission from their union warlords and overlords to decide what to think and how to vote. That's a Liberal Party value and a Liberal tradition. I think there is definitely some robust cattle trading going on in Canberra. Uh, the Prime Minister is trying to navigate and negotiate a very delicate piece of legislation through Parliament that they went to the election on and have a mandate from the Australian people to deliver. Now, I, I heard um, parts of your interview um, just before around, um, around the legislation and, you know, you and I are both Christians, Catherine, I, I know as an employer that it's already... Uh, illegal for me, for example, to discriminate as an employer uh, against anyone on the basis of their religious beliefs. The, the thought wouldn't ever, ever occur to me, but unfortunately we've, we're in a society that is so fraught and so woke and so um, aggressive towards anyone of any faith that I, I do mm. think there is a space where this legislation is needed. And the example given before is a perfect one. If you send your, your child uh, to a faith-based school, be that a Muslim school or a Christian school or a Catholic or an Anglican school, you have a reasonable expectation um, as a parent who is paying for that education to, for your child to be educated along the, the faith-based values that that school represents. Now, the outworking mm. of that is where the delicate stuff lies. And anyone who thought that this would look differently in Parliament or look different in Parliament is fooling themselves. It was always going to be a little bit messy.